so yes, welcome. Um, as a, let's see, was a quick overview and agenda of today's presentation. I will introduce to you the Siena Project, which as I mentioned, Trilateral Research is a partner in. Um, I'm also going to sort of explain what we mean by societal concerns and how we've defined it in the context of this project, as well as researchers' needs. Of course, when we're talking about public research funding, uh, researchers are a key and critical stakeholder. And then last but certainly not least, most importantly, I will present to you highlights from the methodology that we have developed for identifying and addressing societal concerns in the context of public research funding. So just a couple quick notes, um, Siena Project on the whole as an overview. So Siena stands for Stakeholder Informed Ethics for New Technologies with High Socioeconomic and Human Rights Impact. It's an EU-funded research project at Horizon 2020. And we focused on three emerging tech fields, which were in artificial intelligence and robotics, human enhancement, and human genomics. And the project has been running for the past three and a half years. We're actually in our final month now. And this particular presentation, as well as the methodology, is sort of part of the final set of frameworks and tools that we are producing as a result of all of the research that has already been conducted. So simply put, and this is a bit of a gross uh, oversimplification, but simply put, the Siena project as an ultimate objective uh, is intended to develop a set of ethics frameworks and tools that address present and future ethical issues in the three technology fields that I just mentioned. And as I said, we are ending the very, or nearing the end of our project here. And this methodology for public research funding particularly for public research funding organizations, is a specific task within the Siena project that is intended to develop a general methodology for public research funding organizations to identify and to take into account important societal concerns related to research involving new and emerging technologies. And in the context of Siena, those societal concerns relate to ethical human rights and socioeconomic impacts. So the scope of this presentation and the scope of the methodology that I'll be presenting does relate specifically to new and emerging technologies, as of course that was the scope of Siena. It is tailored, as I've said, to public research funding organizations, which in shorthand I may refer to as PRFOs, um, just to keep things a little shorter. Uh, however, even though it is tailored for PRFOs specifically, we did write it in such a way that it can be adapted for use by any organization involved in funding research activities on new and emerging technologies, uh, including private research funding. So the methodology for developing our methodology, how did we do it? Um, breaking it down into sort of three component parts. Societal concerns were identified throughout the Siena project, um, and those were relates to all three technology areas that we looked at in genomics, human enhancement, and AI and robotics. And the way that we kind of collected a non-exhaustive, but a rather comprehensive list and idea of those societal concerns included through uh, stakeholder engagement, for example, with public opinion, a very large public opinion survey, as well as citizen panels. And we also did a lot of desk research. Of course, other partners in the Siena project, uh, including trilateral research, have a lot of experience in um, ethical analysis. Um, in terms of identifying researchers' needs, that was done through desk research and then personal experience of Siena partners. Of course, many of uh, those of us on the consortium have research experience ourselves and, and continue to engage in our own research as the project uh, moves forward. And last but not least, we did look at current policies and practices and procedures. Um, we did that by desk research, so researching mostly online, but also through direct consultation with public research funding organizations, primarily in Europe. And that was done through individual interviews um, in the time of COVID, of course, online and uh, on the telephone, but also through a online workshop with um, PRFOs, invitees in December. We held two identical workshops in mid-December um, where we had a chance to get a lot of incredibly valuable feedback. Now, we didn't start from scratch in building this methodology. Um, of course, there has been a lot of work in recent years in understanding how 
research um, you know, impacts society at large. Many of you, I'm sure, uh, especially those of you working at Trilateral and in the EU context are familiar with responsible research and innovation. Um, there's also the ethical, legal, social implications or aspects framework or approach, uh, which is notably used in the context of genomics and nanotechnology. Uh, in the United States and Canada, you'll often hear of broader impacts criteria. And then, of course, there's all kinds of impact assessment frameworks, social, ethical, environmental, socioeconomic, just as an initial example. And for that, we did look specifically at a, a CWA produced out of the Satori project on ethics assessment of research and innovation, as well as a toolkit for societal impact assessment from the ASSERT project. And also uh, a quick shout out to one of my colleagues who is working in Siena uh, Marina on developing social economic impact assessment as well. So we had a lot of different things that we looked at as sort of a way to start and then sort of asked ourselves, how could we improve these existing frameworks and make them even stronger? And more importantly, how could we tailor a set of recommendations to public research funding organizations? So quickly, how did we define societal concerns? And I acknowledge that this is not a term that is commonly used as something that we did develop for this particular uh, project, for this particular task. So for the purpose of this task, we have identified and defined societal concerns as a concern identified by the general public that relates to negative impacts or harms uh, that result directly or indirectly from research activities and outputs involving new and emerging technologies. And I'm going to go through each one of those steps individually. I'll note that there is, it's impossible to put together a comprehensive, exhaustive list of societal concerns, um, but we have provided somewhat as a baseline or as an illustrative list, uh, a, all of the things that came out of the Siena research, and that is included as an annex to our final deliverable report. So the first is concerns that come from the general public. And what we mean by that is concerns that are voiced or raised by non-experts, right? So these are people who are not academics, who aren't policymakers, who aren't representatives of industry. This is truly your grassroots, everyday people kind of on the street. Therefore, this really relies on identifying things from the bottom up. The second element is that we were focused on negative impacts or harms. Of course, we recognize that research produces and leads to countless positive impacts on society, and we don't mean to downplay those, but we did want to focus on ways to capture things that may not always be captured, particularly related to negative concerns. Um, in the context of Siena, because it was within the remit of our project, we narrowed it a little bit more to just looking at ethical, human rights, and socioeconomic impacts, but it would also be impacts, for example, related to uh, economics, to environmental, et cetera. Uh, so it could, could even be a broader list. Uh, and lastly, we focused on results or impacts related to the outputs of research and not necessarily to the research process itself. So this is not a methodology for talking about research integrity. There's you know, quite a bit of work on how research should be carried out. This is really more focused on what will happen with the research and the research materials and the ideas that are generated, what happens after, and how will that research then impact society in the near term and also importantly in the medium and in long term. So just to give you sort of a idea of some of the impacts that we or concerns that we have identified in the context of Siena. This is just a an example of some of them that came out of one technology area, which was AI and robotics. You can see this sort of range from very high level concerns to things that are much more particular and much more specific. So for high level things like loss of human control, loss of human autonomy, uh, and you know, general sense of the dehumanization of society and undermining the rule of law. Also very you know, more particular things, things that we hear quite a bit about um, in nowadays, right, related to inequality with bias and discrimination, um, the potential for job losses and unemployment, particularly in the context of AI, um, excuse me, robotics in the workplace, um, privacy and data protection, you know, physical harms, for example, with uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems and killing by drones, 
So really a broad range of concerns were identified, as I mentioned before, through stakeholder engagement and then desk research in the Siena project. And just to touch briefly on this idea of researchers' needs, because we didn't focus on it in too much detail, but we did want to be conscious of the practical realities of carrying out research. And we wanted the recommendations that we put forward for public research funding organizations to be responsive to what it is that researchers actually need when conducting their research. So, of course, in addition to funding uh, and to the, the materials and the resources that they need to, to do research, uh, we sort of identified three areas where researchers need to be supported in their research process. And the first is clarity. So researchers need to know what's expected of them, both in the proposal writing process and when they're carrying out their research. And I'd say this is especially true when new expectations, such as those related to societal concerns, are introduced. The second is flexibility, in the sense that researchers need to be able to adapt their research activities to foreseen and unforeseen challenges, and to be able to implement appropriate interventions and mitigation strategies. Uh, for example, to be able to minimize potential negative impacts and harms related to societal concerns that emerge during the research process. And then last but not least, researchers also need the resources and guidance to carry out research activities, particularly when parts of those activities relate to something that is not within their immediate field of expertise or research experience. So, for example, when you're when asking them to identify societal concerns that may emerge in their research or asking for stakeholder engagement activities or cross-disciplinary research approaches to be incorporated into research plans. So just a quick high level overview, and then I'm going to go through each one of these steps individually in much more detail. Um, the PRFO methodology, so the methodology for address, identifying and addressing societal concerns, can somewhat be summarized into three steps. Step one, to identify and define the relevant concerns. Step two, to understand how those concerns relate to the research and how the research creates those negative impacts. And then step three, how to address those concerns and mitigate harm. Now, each one of these steps has um, been broken down into a set of recommendations as well as specific ideas that PRFOs can use to sort of implement these, this methodology. Um, this was done in order to be as, as practical as possible. And I'll note that a lot of the, actually almost all of the specific ideas that are in our report and that I will discuss today came directly from talking and consulting with, with public research funding organizations and hearing what kind of programs they are already developing or have piloted because they want to respond to more of these concerns. Um, so almost everything here has, has come directly uh, out of consultation with PRFOs. All of the steps, so all three steps, involve engagement with members of the public. Of course, we're talking about concerns that are identified by the general public. Therefore, there needs to be an ongoing some sort of cycle of continuously engaging and getting perspective and uh, feedback. Now, I've divided, uh, we've divided them into three steps, but that is more of a conceptual organizational strategy in the sense that you know, this is not necessarily the most discreet, right? They're not, you're not going to finish one and immediately move on to the next and then immediately move on to the next. It is quite a cycle with a lot of overlap uh, and most likely the need to return back to one, you know, quote, step before moving on. That also means that there's going to be a need for periodic reassessment. reassessment. And I think this is particularly true as we continue to understand what are the impacts of new and emerging technologies and how it is that certain impacts could have been better addressed and mitigated in the past. And, you know, how can we build that into future projects? So, of course, this is a process that should be should be somewhat continuous. All right. But with that in mind, for um for conceptual organization only, I'm going to start with step one, which has two specific recommendations. The first, um, you know, just as a general note, of course, before we can talk about a addressing in any real substantial way societal concerns in research, we really have to understand what we're talking about. And 
you know, we've done this in the context of the Siena project, but it is something that is relatively new within public research funding organizations, you know, and no one is using this term specifically. So to move forward, and then of course, to provide clarity to researchers, um, a first step is to adopt some kind of high level policy, recognizing and a, recognizing the need to identify and address societal concerns related to new and emerging technologies. And of course, this is important because the type of concerns that will be relevant to different research projects will differ quite quite significantly depending on the type of research. Um, and again, depending on how the types of uh, research or the technologies being developed change. So one, one way to sort of think about this is engaging with members of the public, as I mentioned, um, stakeholder engagement is going to be kind of a constant thread throughout this. But having public research funding organizations engage with members of the public for input and feedback to understand what should be in the policy. What are the types of, of societal concerns and the societal goals that a public research funding organization should have? Um, not only should consultation happen with members of the public, of course, this is in addition to consultation with experts and policymakers, you know, as would normally happen. Um, the consultation should also, or we would recommend that it would also involve feedback from experts from a diverse range of disciplines and not just traditional scientific disciplines, particularly uh, expertise from ethics, from legal and human rights frameworks, as well as social sciences and humanity, humanities. And actually the, the involvement of ethics, human rights, and social sciences and humanities expertise is something that comes up quite frequently uh, in this methodology. The second recommendation is to maintain an illustrative list of societal concerns. As I mentioned, it's impossible to have an exhaustive list, um, but again, to provide clarity and you know, a sense of guidance and support to researchers, it is useful to know what kinds of concerns have been uh, looked at in the past and what might be anticipated to be of concern in future projects. Um, Again, here, consultation with the general public is critical. Now, I'll note that, uh, you know, there are a lot of, of remaining questions about how to best engage with the general public, how to do stakeholder engagement with citizens um, and with civil society organizations. And so part of actually sort of developing this whole process may be the need to actually fund more research on how to involve the general public better. And I think a big question that remains somewhat unanswered is how to do this in a way that is you know, most efficient uh, and effective and of course financially sustainable because we recognize that stakeholder engagement is very time consuming and candidly very expensive. Okay, so step two, which is understanding how research in new and emerging technologies creates impacts. Um, I think that what's really important about this is recognizing that, of course, experts and policymakers, they can identify, you know, the concerns of the general public and often do a very good job of doing that. However, we need the voices of individuals, of civil society organizations, of you know, small community groups, because those voices are often lost and they might identify something that isn't uh, already known to us as researchers or as experts. And so really understanding how research creates impacts with general public is, is critical here. Therefore, recommendation 2.1, which is to conduct stakeholder engagement to understand how societal concerns are connected to research. And again, here, I think that the most important thing is that you know, the general public often really does experience firsthand both negative and positive impacts. And one of the examples to think about is research in healthcare. The, the general public are the patients. They're the ones who will benefit or be harmed by research on you know, new and emerging technology applications in healthcare. Um, recommendation 2.2 is uh, something that's a little bit more on the, specifically on the, the public research funding organization side within the organization, and that's to understand and evaluate societal impacts of previously funded research. 
And what I mean by this is, you know, an assessment of the impacts of previous projects, sort of understand and recognize trends and linkages that could inform future research funding decisions. Now, step three has a set of seven recommendations, so I'll break it up into two different, uh, two different slides. Um, I'd say this is arguably the most important step, which is to actually address those concerns and to mitigate harm. So to either prevent harm from happening or to minimize it as much as possible. Now, this set of recommendations and this step should really be done as early as possible in the research process when you're talking about a particular research project. Um, you know, the earlier that we can identify things, the earlier you know, different types of harms can be mitigated and plans put into place. Um, of course, you know, also have to balance this with the researcher wanting to, you know, have enough clarity about what they should do next. Therefore, we need to be practical in the ways that maximize the most beneficial aspects of research while also protecting society to the highest degree possible. And I hope that the set of recommendations here is somewhat addresses the, that need for clarity, but also flexibility. So first recommendation is, again, these are all tailored at public research funding organizations, is to align funding priorities and programs with societal concerns. Now this applies specifically to PRFOs that have the ability to, have, to influence um, the policy process for setting research priorities. And I understand that that isn't true for all, but for those who do, there's a lot of different ways that the PRFOs can be actively engaged in this alignment. Um, for example, in bringing the public in and involving them in setting research priorities, for example, through multi-stakeholder consultations, through focus groups or, or committee representation. Could also be done through the creation of innovative funding initiatives um, that sort of break the mold of traditional funding models. So for example, uh, instead of being told and given particular research call texts, researchers could be asked to define their own research challenges or, or, or their own research questions. Um, there's also the idea of setting up different types of funding models. So, for example, research being co-funded with other organizations, uh, such as uh, charities or civil society organizations. So a bit of a blended funding model where it's not, the direction is not only coming from public research funding organization. Uh, and then lastly, the PRFOs could consult with, again, ethics experts, human rights experts, and social sciences and humanities experts. And this is just to sort of complement the information that is coming from stakeholder engagement with members of the general public. Uh, recommendation 3.2 which is require greater ethical and social responsibility commitments from researchers uh, to avoid or minimize negative harms. Now, often research ethics focuses on responsible conduct of research and research integrity, as I noted above. This is extremely valuable, it's extremely important, and don't mean to downplay that at all, but don't feel that it is completely sufficient to adequately address the societal concerns uh, that we have identified above. Therefore, you see this is, you know, the potential to ask for a little bit more from researchers. And I think PRFOs can play a major role in putting ethics and social responsibility at the forefront of research, particularly on new and emerging technologies, by asking researchers to respect, for example, the principles of social responsibility, of beneficence, and non-maleficence. So to do, you know, as much as possible to do good and to do no harm to the extent possible. Recommendation 3.3, to encourage researchers to identify potential negative impacts related to societal concerns early in the research process. And this ties back to the idea that the sooner we can identify potential problems, the sooner they can be fixed. Now, of course, in research funding applications, most funders require applicants to provide an impact summary of some type explaining either the scientific, technical, and or economic significance of their proposed research. So building on that idea, research funding organizations could also encourage or even require researchers to identify potential negative impacts related to societal concerns. So this broadens the scope of impact summaries uh, to things that, you know, in addition to the scientific, technical, and economic 
to identify socioeconomic impacts, potential human rights related impacts, um, or in particular cases, maybe even tied to specific previously articulated societal goals or challenges like sustainable development goals, uh, which is something that I think we're uh, seeing already happen in public research funding organizations and we'll continue to see more of. All right, so the final set of recommendations here on step three. The first is encouraging a cross-disciplinary and multi-stakeholder research consortium. So no surprise to anyone here, I think, that there's you know, no single researcher or particular research discipline has the knowledge and tools to effectively carry out research involving these big, complex societal challenges, uh, particularly when we begin talking about new and emerging technologies. And by the same token, you know, a single researcher can't be and should not be expected to be an ethicist, a legal expert, an economist, and an excellent scientific researcher at the same time. It's not feasible, practical, or candidly probably desirable. Therefore, I think the best way to address that is to build a consortia with as you know, a diverse representation as feasible and possible, which can bring together a complementary set of of skills and expertise to a project. And of course, PRFOs can encourage or require this in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, one is to actually explicitly require or encourage cross-disciplinary and multi-stakeholder representation in the proposal. So assess that during the proposal assessment process. Um, to specifically dedicate funding to support cross-disciplinary and multi-stakeholder research activities. And this you know, recognizes that these activities are more time consuming and they are more expensive and they will take dedicated funding to do so. Uh, to another way that PRFOs can support this particular recommendation is to create guidance, tools and resources or to collect those tools and resources to support researchers, to give them more information about how they can be, you know, putting together a better consortium, and then also how to actually engage in these type of activities, multi-stakeholder and cross-disciplinary activities during the research process. And as part of doing that, one particular strategy might be facilitating learning and exchange of best practices amongst projects. So either requiring linkages or encouraging linkages between related projects. Recommendation 3.5 is to encourage and fund activities involving multi-stakeholder engagement with members of the public. I won't say too much more here because I think we've touched on this quite frequently, um, but Essentially, what this means here is not only can PRFOs be engaging with members of the public, but research projects should be as well. And stakeholder engagement activities could and should be built in to research proposals um, and research plans. Recommendation 3.6 is to modify the proposal review process to optimize assessment of societal impacts. And this, of course, is a bit of a reflection on a traditional peer review process that is uh, somewhat rigid. I think this could be done in a number of different ways, for example, by diversifying the review panels to include cross-disciplinary research. So similar to the fact that a single researcher can't be expected to have all these expertise, a panel of representation from one particular research domain uh, would not be able to adequately identify societal concerns. Therefore, we should have representation from, for example, ethics, you know, law and human rights, uh, as well as social sciences. Another way that uh, Recommendation 3.6 could be implemented is by involving non-experts and members of the public in the review process. Uh, perhaps by having a review panel, a complementary review panel of uh, members of the public or to invite members of the public to comment on proposals via an open public consultation process. I know that sounds a bit extreme, but I will say both ideas actually came from PRFOs that are experimenting with this as, as pilot projects. Um, so there is, uh, I can't say yet whether or not there's a best practice, but there is a movement towards trying to discover what may or may not work. Uh, another way of implementing 3.6 could be better training or more training in the first place for reviewers to help recognize societal concerns. And then as a follow up to that, training on how to give advice to researchers during the review process on different types of mitigation strategies and research plan adaptations that may be necessary or advisable in order to help minimize harms before they occur.
And then lastly, the final recommendation 3.7 is to encourage and support impact monitoring and mitigation throughout the research activities. Now, this connects kind of to everything that we've been saying. You know, the first is the idea that, that monitoring for societal concerns is more comprehensive than monitoring for the traditional impact, um, you know, key indicators. It really does require a broader approach to thinking about how the research will impact uh, both in the immediate and in the medium and long term. Secondly, this is not just focusing on, you know, the, the positive bits of impact, but also on negative. Of course, as researchers looking for funding, we want to highlight what's going well in our research. And there's nothing wrong with that, and that's very good, but should be given a space you know, and, and allowed to express what are those potential negative impacts and what can we do to, um, to help minimize them. Uh, third, this recommendation really requires, again, this cross-disciplinary input from experts from different diverse backgrounds, as well as stakeholders, including members of the public. And then lastly, going back to this idea that it is a constant process, impact monitoring for societal concerns cannot happen at the very end of the project and only at the end. It should be something that is periodically done. Therefore, there's an opportunity to stop a potential harm or stop a potential concern from developing further before a project has completed and the harm is potentially you know, much worse um, or irreversible. There's a lot of different ways that PRFOs could help support this. Um, you know, extending research to, co to uh, cover more robust impact monitoring and mitigation activities throughout the process, uh, throughout the research process, um, developing guidance on impact mitigation strategies, and then, of course, allowing for researchers to have greater flexibility in their research activities to respond to, you know, unforeseen or unanticipated impacts that are, that emerge, um, you know, before the end of the project. So sort of in conclusion, the, you know, the general, ultimately the general public, so us as members of the public, in addition to being researchers and experts ourselves, you know, we, we do pay for public research. Therefore, you know, there is an obligation for public research funding organizations and the researchers who receive public research funding to ensure that the research and the outputs of our research particularly research related to new and emerging technologies, has a positive impact on society, uh, which means that societal concerns and societal harms have to be identified and, and addressed in ways that avoid or mitigate as much harm as possible. So this set of recommendations uh, and tools that I've just sort of talked through take into account the public research funding organization's role as well as the researcher's role in the process. Um, you know, the idea is that they are, um, you know, able to be adapted and implemented. There's all kinds of different ideas in there that can be taken in part or in whole. But ultimately, the, you know, our intention is that there's a framework here for finding ways to better identify and address and then, of course, mitigate harm throughout the entire research process.